Amen, amen. I am so glad that the Whitman Ringers are here this morning. Good morning, St. Andrews. It is great to be with you this morning. Um, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm thankful that we get to be gathered in the presence of the Holy Spirit um, and worship our risen Savior. Amen? Yes. Um, and just a, a point of cool history, um, Whitman Ringers, our, our bell choir, um, was named after a woman named Donna Whitman, um, and today uh, would have been her birthday. And so we celebrate uh, Donna and the legacy. Um, uh, her grandmother, she was tragically um, uh, killed in a car accident. I um, mean, her grandmother bought bells. Am I, March Church, uh, bought, uh, who's a member of the church here, um, bought bells for our church, and um, we were able to name uh, the, our bell choir after Donna. Um, so that is um, a great. So thank you for um, playing today. Um, again, my name is Matt. Um, if you are new with us, we'd love to be able to connect with you. If this is your 158th time here, um, we'd also love to con continue to connect with you and find ways that we can connect uh, more. And um, you can do that by, uh, we've got connect cards out at our welcome table or by, see, Janet, this is going to happen again. <laughs> Okay, hold on. I'll do this and get in front of Janet. Um, this uh, QR code, um, uh, would love for you that you can scan it or on the bulletin, you can scan that as well and it'll get you all the information that you need for the service, um, but also ways that you can connect. It's been a whole lot of fun over the last three services. We have been celebrating our graduates um, and at the end of the service, we're going to have a little slideshow for some of them. We've had folks graduate from uh, high school, college, master's degrees. We even had somebody in the last service um, that got their master's degree basically studying John Calvin. Um, she's wicked smart. And we've got, yes, <laughs> us theology nerds, we're like, yay. Um, but uh, it's just been a great morning to be able to celebrate our graduates, and so we'll continue to do that um, one of the other things, one of the coolest ministries um, I think that any church in the area is doing, um, and I'm really, really proud of our team for um, creating it, is well, it's something we call Super Friends. Um, uh, our children's directors, uh, Heather and Shelley, uh, have started this. Really, it's an outreach um, to families to show that their kids that maybe have special needs are, are welcome here that they have a place here, that they are important here. And so they are doing, on June 5th, they've got a uh, family outing that they're doing with their um, special friends, uh, super friends, and we really, really would invite you uh, to investigate a little more and be a part of some of that and help support those ministries. You can do that by going to um, our church website, and you can reach out to Shelly and Heather and find more about that. Um, and uh, this morning, we have a great opportunity uh, to hear a little bit about what's going on in the Gospel Rescue Mission. And so, uh, really excited about that. We've got Lisa Chastain uh, here, who is the Executive Director. But I want to first invite Craig Littlefield up to kick us off. Yep. All right. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Craig. Here, we'll get you. We'll get you. We go. Hey, good morning. You know, our church is really well known for, for doing um, mission work and for helping, helping other people. We help people in Africa and South America and all over the place. But there's a couple of outfits, uh, uh, Interfaith Community Services and Gospel Rescue Mission are two that we've been helping for probably 40 years. And what's unique about these two things is we don't just write checks for them, but we help them. I mean, and I'm sure most of the people in this room have helped with either one of those two outfits over these years. And um, with Gospel Rescue Mission, uh, Lisa, who's going to come up here in a minute. Come on up here, Lisa. Come on. 
Lisa's grandfather started a gospel rescue mission here in Tucson, 52, 19, 1953. And it grew from a little uh, shelter, really, on 28th Street to what it is now. And it's just got, they got the Women's and Children's Centers, and they got that, they took over that hotel in South Palo Verde, and they built that up into a, a really facility that's, that provides all, course, all sorts of services. This church, we've, uh, there's two, there's several things we've done. Over the years, we've helped them with, with uh, in a lot of ways, we helped them build a couple of rooms down the Women's Center. Two that are going right now is I run the Sandwich Squad. How many are in the Sandwich Squad? Got people out here in the Sandwich Squad? We got 160 families in the Sandwich Squad that provide lunches every week. We do 10,000 lunches a, a year we take down there. What I like about it is not just money, it's effort. Each, each person puts in you know, an hour every eight weeks. It's not much. But collectively, that many people make a real big contribution. Uh, my wife, who runs a Friday Bible study, they also, they also give them uh, the kids that are down there staying there. They give them clothes so they can go to school. You know, they, they just like all the other kids, and they, and they help them at Christmas and, and do other things. So this church is a, a real contributor to them, and we, we appreciate them, and they praise us. And, uh, anyway, I'd like to turn this over to Lisa, and she can tell you more. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate it. Thank you all so much. And, you know, like Craig said, Craig was telling me stories, and I'm serious. He has more stories about Gospel Rescue Mission than I do. But he said that he's been serving in some capacity for 40 years. So thank you so much for, uh, for supporting us uh, with your prayers, with your financial contributions, for your service, uh, for your in-kind contributions. You drop enough clothing to our centers or furnitures or practical needs. Uh, backpacks, uh, hygiene items. So you guys help us so much, you know, and Gospel Rescue Mission is completely funded by private funds. So it takes, uh, it takes everybody uh, contributing to make us available to serve those that are broken and, need, and in need. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm Lisa Chastain, Gospel Rescue Mission. My, my grandfather actually started Go Gospel Rescue Mission, like he said, in 1953. Uh, he was a yard master at Southern Pacific Railroad. And at that time, back in those days, you know, it was hobos riding the rails. And uh, so he developed so much compassion and started bringing clothes and food from home. And so that eventually just grew into so much compassion that he felt like God was calling him to leave the railroad and start the mission. So that started, uh, you know, so much good work. We've been, to, uh, next year will be 70 years that we've been in Tucson, and it's certainly, thank you, yeah, certainly, <laughs> certainly the uh, face of homelessness has changed over the years. Um, so, uh, so I'm glad to be a part of the great work that he started. Uh, so Gospel Rescue Mission, you heard that we have on a Miracle Mile, we have our Women's Recovery Center, and that's where we serve women and children that are in need of addiction recovery. Now, our addiction recovery is no small chore. Uh, it's a year-long program because people in addiction, the 30, 60, 90-day programs are not successful for most. We're there changing people's value systems. You know, their values on the streets are lying, cheating. Um, uh, and so we bring them in and try to teach them how to live honestly and with integrity and, of course, introduce them to the hope that's in Christ. Uh, in 2017, we had an opportunity to be a part of remodeling the old uh, Holiday Inn Holodome Hotel on South Palo Verde. Well, that was a monumental feat, but we serve a monumental God. Amen? Amen. So we started our journey. We opened in 2019 with uh, 350 shelter beds and 32 organizations partnering together under one campus to bring hope and help to those that are struggling. So I had a little cheat sheet because the list of services have gotten so great that I have to refer to a sheet. So of course, Gospel Rescue Mission serves as we call the, the anchor tenant or the, the master leaseholder there. 
Uh, we provide shelter, meals. Uh, on the meals and the sandwiches, by the way, uh, I think Karen and Craig said that you contribute 10,000 sandwiches a year. Well, all together we did last year 175,000 meals uh, through all of our centers at Gospel Rescue Mission, and that 10,000 is definitely included in that to total. Uh, addiction recovery, we do workforce development. We placed 500 people in jobs last year. 500 people got jobs last year. And we don't just put them in jobs, we teach them how to maintain their job and grow in their job. Uh, El Rio Health is there with the full service medical and dental clinic. Uh, DES is there providing enrollment and management of benefits. Pima Community College offers job training for construction, IT, culinary, uh, logistics, forklift, CDL for certification for higher paying jobs. Catholic Community Services is soon going to be offering a 40 bed medical respite center. We're going to have dog shelter services coming soon. We have a stable of attorneys that donate their time to get people out of their legal entanglements. We provide mental health services by three different organizations, Wellbeing El Rio and La Frontera. We have a wellness center that provides a full workout gym and exercise classes for physical well-being. We have homeless court there. We have organizations that provide IDs. So we are a holistic approach to the problem. And uh, our goal was always to bring people in off the streets, offer them life-saving services and programs to get them not only stable, but to put them on a path of successful life. So your contribution helps us do that. So thank you so much. Thank you for what you do. We have a short video that just sends our gratitude from some of the people that we've served. We're gonna have a table out in, t in the gathering area. So if you wanna learn mo more about what we do, please come visit us. Thank you. Helping the hungry and hurting become successful and finding new life in Christ is what we do every day here at Gospel Rescue Mission. Your generous support is a testament of God's grace and His love for all. So thank you. We couldn't do it without you. Your support helped get my family back together. Thank you. Your support has helped me mentally, physically, and spiritually. Thank you. Thank you. Because of your support, I found my recovery and my sobriety. Without your support, I wouldn't have been able to get my family back. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank you for your support. It has changed my life. So thank you. Your support has helped me to get a new home, a new job, and a new beginning. Your support saved me and my family. Thank you. Amen. Well, the Gospel Rescue Mission does such amazing work here in Tucson, and it is an honor to be a part of it. Um, and at least at some point, we'll have to talk about the Southern Pacific, because my dad was a railroad engineer um, uh, for Southern Pacific. But uh, can we just pray over Gospel Rescue Mission and the work? But I also want to give a huge shout out um, Craig Littlefield, Craig and Jan do so much uh, here, but having started the Sandwich Squad, I want to pray for a Sandwich Squad. And if you're interested in joining Sandwich Squad, really it's every weeks. One hour every eight weeks. Uh, putting together some sandwiches and then delivering them to Gospel Rescue Mission. If you're interested in being a part of that, uh, Craig's going to be out um, there, and I thank Karen for um, being such a great liaison uh, for them, for the mission committee as well. Uh, but let's pray. Gracious and loving God, I thank you so much for the work of the Gospel Rescue Mission. God, I thank you so much for um, 70 years of, of service to this community. I just can't begin to think about the number of lives that were changed uh, through you, um, through the Gospel and Rescue Mission, God, and what has happened over the last 70 years. God, we just uh, continue to pray for Lisa and all the staff and all the, um, all the folks that are creating vision for what is next, um, God, and what, how you are leading them into service in this community. And so, God, we just pray a huge blessing over the Gospel and Rescue Mission. 
God, we thank you for um, just their work and knowing that um, their love for you is fruitful in that they are able to serve this community so well. And God, we also thank you so much for the sandwich squad here at St. Andrews and um, and Craig and Jan and all of that they have done for the gospel rescue mission, but also in, through the sandwich squad, God. And we just ask that you stir in all of us that maybe we might be able to join that mission um, to be able to serve you and to serve this community so well. God, we know and trust that this is your community, that this is a place that you love. And so, God, help us be your hands and feet, your bright shining light uh, to love people here. It is your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. As we continue in worship, let us take a deep breath, knowing and trusting that God's love is for us now and forever as we are led into worship. As we are called into worship by God, would you stand and join me in this morning's call to worship that is based on Psalm 16. We keep the Lord always before us because God is at our right hand. We shall not be moved. For you, O Lord, do not give us up to the grave, nor let your faithful ones see the pit. Let us worship God.
seated. We're also thankful to Pat Kaltenberger for being our keyboardist, organist today. Thank you for being with us. We have all kinds of guests today. Uh, in the Bible, in Isaiah, in the first chapter, it says uh, there's an invitation from God. It says, come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Now, whenever you hear God say, let's settle the matter, you have to wonder, okay, what's coming? It says, though your sins are like scarlet, uh-oh, they shall be as white as snow. Well, that's good. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. This is an invitation in spite of our sin to come to God and to come clean. Will you join me as together we share in our unison prayer of confession, followed by a time of silence. Holy God, in Jesus Christ, you call us to follow, to walk in your ways, and to seek your truth. Jesus keeps calling, but we keep turning away, finding excuses and giving our hearts to other gods. Still, Jesus calls to us, in spite of our sin, Holy Spirit, help us to hear the call of Christ. Release us from the entanglements that prevent us from following him. Forgive our sins according to your loving kindness and draw us ever closer to your heart from which we can freely live and move and have our being. Amen. Friends, in Jesus, and by virtue of our baptism, we are offered a cleansing that we cannot do ourselves. Yet the God of grace and mercy pours out goodness and forgiveness to all who come and ask. And the Lord freely gives. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Amen. says that if you have been set free, then you are free indeed. As God in Christ has heard our confessions and forgiven us our sins, let us now offer that same forgiveness and peace to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Please share peace.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the letter of James, chapter 1, beginning at verse 19. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourself of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror, for they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they look like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If they think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is the word of the Lord.
God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Uh, yeah, and we want to say amen when we hear something good. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Uh, we are continuing our sermon series that began, uh, well, this is our third week into it. We're looking at the book of Galatians, and we're ca- talking, calling it IDX. And how is it that we are discovering our true identity in Christ? Okay, and uh, Paul was kind of like a coach, helping the, those Galatians, uh, the, the people of that region of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Uh, there were a number of Christian communities that he had started and that were going astray. Have any of you ever coached anything? Yeah, look at you. Look at all you coaches. Oh, yeah. Um, I've, I've coached, uh, in fact, baseball. No, actually, I didn't coach baseball. I coached soccer. I, I, I guess I was involved with t-ball for a bit. But then there was basketball. And I'll tell you, I was one of the greatest coaches of nine-year-olds. It was really a f- fantastic, fantastic experience. We won a championship one time. Yes. Nothing better than when a coach, when you're working with players to kind of get it, you know, working together as a team, you know, like with T-ball, if they're running the right direction, like that is a victory. (laughs) If they're scoring a goal in the opponent's goal, that is a victory, right? (laughs) And so the, the idea of a coach is so important. You want your players to kind of hear your teaching and you practice and practice and then but when it's time to to play it's it's on them they have to do it and I imagine Paul felt a bit like this right that he had done the teaching and then they were going astray and he was like ah any of you Phoenix Suns fans out there yeah there is a game seven today that the Phoenix Suns are playing this is professional basketball in case you're wondering and uh, I'm a Suns fan, and they're, yeah, game seven, and they have the best coach in the league. He was voted to be the coach of the year, and imagine being the coach of the year, and yet you are now at the brink of either winning to go to the Western Conference Finals, or you lose and you just stay home. And, and what do you tell your players? Just do what I've been telling you to do. Just do what you do. Paul is writing to these Galatians saying, remember what got you here, Jesus. Don't do anything more than Jesus. Now, we've been learning this uh, memory verse, right? You've been memorizing this at home, right? Nod your head, yes. And I'm going to show it only for the new people who haven't been here the last couple of weeks. If you've, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, do not look at the screen. Okay, this is a memory, this is, this is a quiz, okay? Uh, I'm going to look at it just because uh, it helps me lead everyone else. <laughs> but I know it. You can stop me and I'll, I'll recite it for you if I can stop you and recite it, if you recite it for me. Okay, got it. All right, so let's say it together. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. All right, keep at it. This is something you can memorize. Uh, We've got the chain here, okay? This is one of the ways that I know that our kids were memorizing it. There are basically six links in this chain. And I've also put post-its on my door. If you come by my office, I've got six post-its that have it in those six phrases. And uh, that's been a way that I've been able to to use to memorize it because I'm not the best at memorizing things. Okay, so because of the grace of Jesus, our old selves are dealt with. They are crucified with Christ. And there is a new life that is established and made possible because of Jesus. And if you have been a recipient of this transaction of grace, then you have a new identity that defines you, and you have a new wardrobe of being clothed with Christ. And you might remember last week I said, in Christ, at least, there are no wardrobe malfunctions. 
Now, we might have some malfunctions ourselves, but in Christ, as we are clothed with Christ, there will not be a malfunction. God is faithful. And so God's grace is an abundant treasure of goodness that is heaped upon his children, and it is the most important resource from which to live. In contrast to the non-renewable resources of this world, and I know there's all kinds of talk about our, the non-renewable resources and the cost of them. In contrast to those, grace is God's infinite resource for renewal and transformation into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So Paul was countering these false teachers who taught that the new Christian believers who weren't Jewish, didn't have a Jewish background, actually had to become Jewish. And for men, that meant a very painful obligation of circumcision. Later on, I'm not going to read this verse, but later on, Paul is so angry about this requirement that these other people are, are putting upon these new believers that he says, I wish they, those people who are required, this, would go ahead and just, just go all the way and just cut it all off themselves. And it's like, oh my gosh, Paul, your language is too earthy for me. If you want to know where that is, that's in verse 12 of chapter 5. But let's go back and read from the beginning. Galatians 5, verse 1. I think we've got it here. Paul writes, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I'm going to skip to verse 6, where it says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Now, if you read this verse out of context, you're like, why is Paul talking about circumcision? Well, it had to do with this, this thing that they were arguing about. But I want you to really pay attention to that second part of that verse. What is important? What is the thing that matters most? The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. If you, if you brought your Bible with you, I want you to underline it, highlight it, whatever it is that you do to remember that, because that is so, so important. Does this sound like freedom? Now, some people think that freedom has something to do with just, I get to do whatever I want to do. But Paul says, no, freedom is about instead, it's this idea of you're free from keeping the regulations of judgment that are based on the law. You see, Jesus stood in our place of judgment when he died on the cross. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, talked about this concept of costly grace, that our grace, though it is free to us, is costly to God. And so if we realize that our freedom costs something, then, then we will live in a new way. You see, Jesus paid our debt. Jesus freed us from enslavement. Jesus substitutes himself for us, and in so doing, clothes us with a goodness and a beauty and a character that are not our own. So it's not just about a freedom that says, oh, I get to do whatever the heck I want to do. That's simply not the case. And Paul anticipates this attitude when he writes in verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Freedom, Paul would tell us, is for service, not for selfishness. 
You are free to be selfish, but in so doing, you will experience ultimately enslavement. You see, service is rooted in the Spirit's movement. That a life lived in response to grace is a life that is obedient to Jesus. And you maybe heard that quote of even what Jesus said. Paul quotes Jesus without attributing it, but says, to love your neighbor as yourself. So what is the remedy for a selfish life? Remember that second half of verse 6 before. It is to serve one another humbly in love. That could be a sermon series all on its own. Those four phrases. Serve one another humbly in love. Selfishness is rooted in a sin nature that we inherit by virtue of being in the human family. You see, sin feels natural. It's deeply rooted in us, in our bodies, and in our flesh. Yet, a selfish attitude is toxic. And it says that I'm going to live freely, and in so doing, I'm free to sin, because God will always forgive me, which is, which is true. But what is also true is that sin always has its consequences. I'm sure you have encountered people in your life with toxic attitudes. You've, if you've had a relationship with a, a toxic person, a friendship, or even a marriage relationship, you're, you're never quite sure which side is up. And that's because a toxic person tries to take control of everything and in every situation to suit their needs in that way. So it's very difficult to live with someone who needs such control. There's a list of acts of, of what Paul is calling acts of the flesh that I'm not going to read, and it's because it's not a how-to manual, right? You can read that on your own if you want later, verse 19. But there's all kinds of interesting words here, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. Paul warns us, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But some of you might look at a list like this and go, huh, now some of this sinning actually sounds kind of fun. Heck, selfishness is fun. Isn't it just like God to want to keep us from having fun. What's God's deal anyway? Why would I want to stop that? My response to that attitude is that you might experience all kinds of, uh, you might experience acts that are of the, of the flesh, Paul would say, as fun, but probably what you don't realize is that there's such a thing as counterfeit fun. It's not real fun as the Spirit would define it because real fun lasts. Real fun is eternal. Other kinds of fun are here and then gone. Counterfeit fun is temporary. It will not ultimately bring satisfaction. What was that verse I read earlier? The only thing that matters, the only thing that really counts is faith expressing itself through love. True freedom does not come by walking alone or with those who are going the wrong direction. True freedom comes from keeping in step with the Spirit. So the Spirit-led life of service begins as a seed of faith, and when it is cultivated through the consistent walking in the Holy Spirit day by day, it produces something called fruit. And Paul explains it this way in Galatians 5, starting at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and forbearance. Now, if you've memorized this list before, you may have memorized the word patience there. So forbearance is like patience on steroids, like patience with people. Oh. I'll continue. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Now in two weeks, we're going to start a new series that's going to continue through June and July. It's going to be all about the fruits of the Spirit. So, so don't forget this. Kind of, if you've got your Bible with you, keep your thumb there. Okay, we're going to keep coming back to that. Like, like I want you to hold your Bible for the next two months, right? And keep your thumb right there in Galatians 5. If you've been memorizing Galatians 2.20, you'll probably notice a phrase there in verse 24 when it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Does that ring in a bell to you? To the ringers, maybe? I don't know. Sorry. I couldn't resist that one. Sorry. You see, it is the truth of the statement and the power of God that makes it possible to heal. When we have walked in the flesh or when we've experienced sin in our lives, it is this promise that allows us to come around and be healed. I'm so glad that Lisa's here from the Gospel Rescue Mission and, and that a core part of their work is to work with people who are in addiction. It might be substances, though. It might be, you know, codependent relationships. It could be something else like uh, the, the need to control so what is an addiction? Well, in my very simple understanding, this is my layman's definition, I think an addiction is a lie that your body, your flesh, tells you that you can't live without something that is actually toxic for you, whether a substance or an activity or a relationship. The reason addictions are so damaging is because of the pattern of lies that emerges and the physical sensation of need that develops even in the flesh and the body that can make someone just feel powerless except to follow that urge. But the good news is that there is power available for healing. And it begins with being rooted in the truth. It begins when an addict is ready to hear and listen to someone speaking the truth in love. And what is the truth? The truth of the gospel is that there is a God who loves you so much that he would send his son to die for you. Even to crucify your old self on that cross so that you would be made new again. Can we say our memory verse one more time? I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this goodness. This good news, Lord, that tells us no matter what road we've been on, uh, whether we've been turning the wrong way or if we've been through murkiness and un unclarity, that you invite us to know the truth of who you are and the truth of who we are. And that you enable us to walk holy and blameless in a new way. So we pray, oh God, for all people. We pray for graduates as they enter into this new phase of life, for it is not necessarily just a ending, it is a beginning. And we ask that you would bless them and each one of us as we step forward into uh, this future, Lord, that we do not control, but which you have in your hands, that we might live a life of service over selfishness, that we would know what matters most, and that is living by faith through the power of giving witness to your love. It's in Jesus' name your name that we pray. Amen.
be seated. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Gracious and loving God, we give you great thanks for this day and every day that you grant us. We thank you for the ways that you continue to show up, um, the ways that we can sense your presence among us, whether it's the new breath in our lungs, the grace and mercies that we receive, the sunrise or sunsets, the beautiful flowers of the springtime. God, we just thank you. We thank you for your love and grace and mercy that abound. God, we thank you for the, the, the ways that you continue to pour yourself into us so that we may be the fruit of your love, that our lives might reflect all that you have done and will continue to do in us and through us. So God, sometimes as we come to church, we come seeking a peace. Sometimes we come with hearts um, just confused and hearts that are hardened, hearts that are in need of your grace. And so God, no matter where we find ourselves this morning, would you pour yourself out upon us? In this very moment, God, that you would pour yourself upon us, that we would sense your presence, that we would sense your peace, that we would sense your comfort in all our discomforts, God, that we would sense uh, the ways that you are leading us and guiding us. That we would sense how beloved we are because of your love. That each and every one of us has inherent worth. All who we meet have inherent worth because of your love. So God, as we receive that love, help us be that love whether that is here around Tucson or we find ways to do it across this country or across this world, whether that is through acts of generosity, acts of kindness, acts of um, using, physically using our hands and feet to do something so that others will know you more, so that others will know your peace, that others will have access to food, have access to clean water. People will know peace in regions of war. God, again, we continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the Middle East. We pray for our brothers and sisters all across this world who are in fear. Would you grant them peace? Would you grant them a sense of your love and grace and mercy that is washing over them? A sense of identity that they are known and they are loved. They are beloved children of God. God, help us be your hands and feet to this world who's in so desperate need of hope. God, we thank you for the ways that you have loved us and taught us that you continue to teach us. Like Jesus taught his disciples praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Lord Jesus, you withheld nothing as you went through your life of teaching, of calling people into relationship with you, of obedience in seeking the kingdom of God. You withheld nothing as you followed the Father's will even to the cross. Lord, we rejoice in your resurrection, that you call forth lives to be transformed according to your image and likeness, and that we would become generous as you are generous. So bless, O Lord, the offerings of our lives now, those who give and those who are um, in in a position, Lord, to give of time and talents and treasure. And Lord, for those who struggle, Lord, we ask that you would allow them to know the riches of your goodness. It is beyond a mere material blessing, Lord, but which calls forth a life transformed. Lord, we give you thanks and we praise you. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Today we are uh, wanting to honor graduates and we want to um, pray for them and we've been doing that all morning and uh, we have a way that we'd like to do that. We have a video that has a number of our graduates with photos and it has uh, kind of where they're graduating from and we're going to play that and you're invited to kind of stay after the benediction and just to kind of enjoy that. Uh, we're going to, it actually has music to it, but we're going to kind of mute that music so that, Pat, you can still play your postlude and we'll listen to the postlude and watch the, that video. Does that make sense? So feel free to stay where you are. You don't have to leave, but you can if you need to. But also, if you'd like prayer, uh, we've got our prayer team over here. We've got two folks by the crosses. They'd love to encourage you and pray for you. Also, uh, we have other Stephen ministers that are outside the doors here near our prayer tower. They'd love to encourage you in prayer. Uh, And I want you all to remember something important today. What is it that matters most? It it is faith that is being lived out through the practice of love, right? So whether you are a graduate moving on or whether you are simply needing to graduate beyond this room to get to lunch. (laughs) This is the invitation for you to trust this future that is unknown to you, to a God who knows the future, who is willing to uh, walk with you by the Spirit, to enliven you, enable you to live by faith, knowing that you'll never be left behind or forsaken. So may you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the power and peace of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen.